All right. Hey, everybody. Um, well, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'm excited to talk about container optimized Linux and, and probably talk about, you know, why it's the best idea that you're not actually using. Um, so um, let's go ahead and get started before I go any further. Who am I and why the heck should you listen to me? Uh, well, my name is Kyle Davis. I'm the senior developer advocate for Bottle Rocket, um, which is a container optimized Linux distribution at Amazon at AWS. Um, so I'm pretty excited to be presenting to you. Um, I'll let you know, I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, uh, which is nowhere near Columbia, Maryland. Uh, but it, if you look on a map, uh, you'll see it's very, very far. But I actually used to live in Maryland for many, many years. I met my wife there. We lived up in Baltimore. Uh, my dentist was in Columbia and he is, still sends me emails. So I'm not going to come to Columbia to go to the dentist, but it is what it is. Um, and, you know, I work for this kind of obscure operating system in Amazon, and um, I really enjoy talking about it. I think it's really actually kind of an important subject uh, to talk about. Um, so let's go ahead and get started and then just kind of go over the agenda a little bit. Um, first, I'm going to go over what host OS is and then what container optimized Linux is in that context. Talk about how they're different, what advantages do they bring, and when I'm going to talk it up the whole time, and then I'm going to tell you when you shouldn't use it. Um, so we'll go over that because it's uh, it's not for everybody, but it is a really cool little uh, thing to see. So um, let's go ahead and go into like the host OS. What What is this particular thing? Uh, when you look at something that you want to run a bunch of containers, right? Running containers on your laptop or whatever is pretty straightforward. You run Docker run and or whatever your favorite utility to run that is, and you, you're good to go. When you want to run it in production though, things are a little bit different. Um, you want to be able to manage it and you have to think about where it's going to run and what happens once one dies and all that great stuff. And, and that's where something like an orchestrator comes in, something like Kubernetes. Uh, there are other ones in the Amazon context. There's ECS, there's HashiCorp Nomad. There's all sorts of different options there. And um, when you start doing that, you, you have a few different parts. Let's look at the parts of that. Um, you have the control plane. The control plane is what you interact with most often when you are administering a cluster. And that control plane talks to the data plane. Um, and the data plane contains a bunch of containers. And these containers, of course, aren't just floating in space. They are running on some sort of machine or instance. Uh, those are your nodes in a, in a uh, orchestrated cluster. And then on top of that, you have to say, okay, you can't just run a container on their hardware most of the time. There is ways to do that, but most of the time you're running multiple containers. So you have some sort of operating system below that, and that's the host operating system. Um, I mentioned a bunch of orchestrators, they all work roughly the same. Uh, they have this kind of same pattern. Um, now, tonight we're going to be talking about host OSs, but there is another operating system in the mix. If you take a look at your container itself, you might say, well, it's running. Ubuntu in the container. And well, that, that's kind of like your base image. Um, and that is something different than what we're talking about tonight. So we're talking about the actual Linux distribution that's running on the instance itself. Um, and then the containers are running on top of that host OS. Um, so it's important to make sure that distinction is there. Uh, and we're all on the same page. Now, when we talk about specialization in Linux distributions, um, there's a few things we have to go over. You're probably all familiar with general purpose Linux distributions. These are things like Ubuntu or Fedora, Arch, Alpine, anything like that. And they're really flexible. They're designed to run on your laptop. They're designed to run on an instance in the cloud. They're designed to run on you know, IoT devices. They're really flexible and they can do a lot. Um, that's why people use them so often. Um, then you kind of have, when you're going down in specialization, you have another kind of subset well, not really subset, but another set of um, Linux distributions, things like DDWRT, which is for um, routers, and you have FreePBX, which is like running Office phone systems, Chromium OS for Chromebooks, uh, Phoenix, which is like a uh, data recovery Linux distribution, and then my favorite, uh, Doom Linux, which is Linux that boots directly into the 1994 first-person shooter, Doom. And that's all it does, right? Like it just loads Doom and that it has only what's needed to run Doom. And so 
those have very specialized missions, right? Like they're doing something specific. Um, and then you get even more specific and you get into the container optimized Linux distributions. And these are what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Uh, we'll talk about Bottle Rocket. You can see the, the logo for Bottle Rocket kind of off the one side of the screen here, it's made of ASCII art, um, flat car and Talos Linux. These are all three kind of very similar things, um, but they have a very specific mission and their very specific mission is to just be that host OS in the uh, orchestrated cluster on your worker nodes. Um, so when you're thinking about this, though, it's important to kind of make sure you get the directions right on it. Uh, of course, Alpine can run Doom, as Drew mentioned, um, but Doom Linux can't do everything Alpine can do. The arrow direction is really important here, right? Um, and the same thing is true for like Ubuntu. Of course, Ubuntu can run Kubelet, which is the agent that actually enables you to become a worker node in Kubernetes, but Talos can't do everything that Fedora can do or Ubuntu can do, right? So they have this kind of like narrow specialization. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting breed of Linux distributions. Um, now, a distinction I wanna make sure we're kind of all familiar with is a slimmed down versus a built up Linux distribution for containers. Um, slimmed down uh, Linux distributions exist for running containers. You might see something like the, there's the EKS optimized AMI for uh, Amazon, there's, uh, I think it's called Mariner on, on uh, Azure. There's these different um, versions of a kind of mainstream Linux that has been stripped down, right? They remove components to from a general purpose distribution and then the adds and configurations and then it can join a cluster. Um, and that's the way I like to think about this one is like, it's like a, a fast road car. Like you can buy a Porsche, they already go pretty fast, but if you buy a specialized Porsche, they have removed the passenger seats and the radio and the air conditioner, make it lighter to work in that role of being a faster car. Um, so that's one breed, right? We're not gonna be talking about those tonight. We're gonna be talking about something separate. We're gonna talk about a distribution that's built from the ground up to do a specific mission. So it starts with a clean sheet. Um, they then carefully add components and then integrate with those orchestrators um, to join a cluster. So it's it's two different directions, right? Um, the way I like to think about that, it's like an F1 race car, right? Um, it didn't start out as anything else. It was designed to run as a race car um, and it has some similarities with a fast road car or the car you're getting groceries in, uh, four wheels and engine, so on and so forth, but they're very different, right? They have different, parts that they're trying to fill. So with those few distinctions in mind, um, you can kind of start to see a picture emerging, right? We have these, you know where it's operating in the orchestrated cluster, you know, uh, you know what this looks like as far as in concept of all the different Linux distributions, and you can see the different things that we've got here. But um, these are container optimized Linux distributions. We're talking about the other one. We're not going to talk about the other one. They, they really are a form of general purpose distribution. Um, but you can kind of look at this and see where we're going to start talking about tonight. Um, now, I, I usually present this as a Bottle Rocket and Friends. Um, I'm going to talk about a general category tonight. Um, it's not a single project, right? Um, when I think about that, I, there it's almost kind of like the zeitgeist that these all came out around the same time from different vendors. Um, so I have to speak kind of broadly when I'm talking about it. Um, uh, I, I do want to acknowledge that I'm going to use Bottle Rocket as a representative. And I'm doing that for utility, mostly in this circumstance. Uh, I will compare and contrast it with Bottle Rocket. I'll say Bottle Rocket's like this. Bottle Rocket is different than something else when I talk about the different products. My point of view is Bottle Rocket just because that's what I do every day. I don't use every effort to represent anything else really accurately. Um, I'm not a technical expert on each project. I have used them. I have read their documentation. I understand how they work, but I can't answer really specific questions. Uh, I do okay in Bottle Rocket doing that sort of thing, but I'm also not perfect there. Um, so some similar projects and ones we're gonna talk about today. Uh, the kind of grandfather of all these is uh, CoreOS, the original CoreOS. There's, there's a new CoreOS, which is actually one of those slimmed down uh, operating systems. Um, but CoreOS is no longer with us in its original form. Uh, that ended, I think, 
2020 ish. Um, and then the new one came in. The core S was then forked or continued, depending on your uh, point of view on that, into flat car Linux uh, by Kenville, which was recently acquired by Microsoft. Um, so you can think of like flat car as the successor to core OS, the OG core OS. Um, then there's Talos Linux uh, by Sidera Systems, which is actually a, an operating system I really respect. It kind of takes many of these ideas to like their full extent, right? It has a very pure way of looking at things. Um, it, is, it is a very fascinating operating system. Um, in some ways, I, I think like they're very pure in their execution of it, right? Like they they really said they have these ideas about how things should run and they've really executed it well. Um, and then there's container optimized OS by Google that's specific to, uh, to Google Cloud. Now I will speak the least about a container optimized OS, not because it's a competitor to the company I work for. I don't really care about that. I'm talking about from Microsoft as well. Uh, but I, it is only available on uh, Google, uh, on Google Cloud. So um, it seems reasonable enough from the documentation I've read, but I know the least about it, just to be honest with you. My only criticism that I have of it is its name. Uh, its name is Container Optimized OS, which is a kind of like Ford calling their next car four-door sedan. I, I, it's kind of just like the same name. Uh, it's like naming it after that. It's very literal. Um, you know what you're getting, but that's my only criticism of, of that particular operating system that I can, can really defend. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the area we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and, and it's a really fascinating area to look at. But the question most people ask me next is, um, why not just use insert general purpose distro as your host OS. Um, and it's a great question. And sometimes it's the right choice to use these general purpose distributions. And, and many times I personally think it's the right choice to use a container optimized um, Linux for your host OS um, for many, many situations. Uh, the reason why I think it is, and, and I don't think you have to use Ball Rocket, there's circumstances where other ones will fit better, whatever. Uh, but Fundamentally, the reason why general purpose distribution is maybe not the great match is that there is a mis mission mismatch between what you're trying to do um, and what they provide. Let me expand on that. To inherently make a general purpose distribution, you are adding unnecessary complexity into your Linux distribution for that. Um, as a consequence, that complexity makes it difficult to secure and maintain those OSs. What one of my principal engineers says, you have a high care and feeding cost. Uh, it's like owning a horse, right? You don't need a horse in this case. Um, so when you're looking at this, I, I think fundamentally you, you, the mission, when you think about what you wanna do with Kubernetes and how you mostly wanna manage their worker nodes, container optimized Linux distribution is usually a really good fit for that. So let's back up a tad and take a look at like the kind of typical Linux interactions when you are working in the cloud, right? The first thing you do is you SSH into your instance, you get a shell, you start uh, changing things with package managers, uh, then you maybe run some scripts and those scripts are doing different things. They use an interpreter, even if it's just bash, it's an interpreted language, excuse me. Um, it comes up to find out that many of these things are kind of counterproductive um, and they're not necessary in many circumstances. When you take a look at this, first things first, the SSH. Everybody knows this is the gates of the castle. This is a common hole that people look for when they're trying to do something nefarious, right? They're going to scan for ports. They're going to do all these different things. You, you have to put as much protection as you can there, but it's it, you have to really be careful. Um, and then SSL itself, the supporting software for it, is actually a pretty big surface area. You have to make sure that SSL is secured because you know you want to make sure you have the most reinforced gate to your castle you can. Um, so it, there's a lot of risk just being able to SSH into a, 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 a node. Um, we are getting to a shell. A shell is actually kind of bonkers. Um, if you think back, like 
what we're emulating when we're running a shell is effectively like a 1970s mainframe. Um, and this is how people will judge if something is exploited, right? If they have shell access, the game over, right? Like that's how somebody will say, you know, I've got access to your system. Um, and then from a like less kind of nefarious point of view, it encourages mutation of your system. Um, we'll talk a lot about mutation and why it's kind of hard to deal with in, in this context later. Um, then we get to the package manager and, oh boy, there's a lot here. Um, it, this package manager and it's, you know, associated um, package repositories are the source of many supply chain problems. A dependency of a dependency has a vulnerability and you have to manage that because you don't know what that version is going and one package uses one version, another version. It's a big mess that you have to manage. Package managers are inherently non-deterministic. Um, when you, uh, let's say, add a package on one instance, um, and then maybe one minute later, you can add a package uh, on another instance, those two things can be different because there could be an update in between, um, which is kind of scary when you're trying to think about, like, do I know what I'm running? They have a near infinite surface area because uh, you can have any different combinations of thousands of packages running uh, in a given host OS. It's you don't really know what you have to secure because of you know supply chain issues. It's it's really hard to think about and get your head around. Uh, and then you have an inconsistent interface inherently with the Unix philosophy. You're installing you know, thousands of tiny little programs that are written by different people who have different philosophies on things and you have to know how to configure and run them appropriately and everyone is slightly different because they have different belief systems and how they think our system should be run or run in a, written in a different language and you have to know how to do all these different things and it's really inconsistent and you have to be an expert and then we get to interpreters and interpreters themselves have vulnerabilities frequently um you know you can maximize your um, memory usage on a, a particular node, but as soon as you fire up a interpreter like Python or something to do to, to do anything on the host OS, you suddenly don't have any memory left because it gobbled up a bunch of memory when it ran into a, a particularly deep loop. Um, and people who are trying to exploit your system will often use these interpreters to make something autonomous after they leave the scene, right? So, um, there's a lot of problems with the typical interactions that we do with Linux in the cloud, but we don't have to. Like all these things are solvable. Um, and that's kind of where most of these container optimized Linux distributions have made different choices. Um, one, immutability, we've talked about mutating things. Um, you can have a read-only root file system if you simplify the OS as much as possible. Um, you don't have to have shells or interpreters. Instead, you can replace it with an API that has a consistent interface. Um, and you don't have to have a shell to interact with that API. Um, you don't have to have a package manager if you make the instance ready to run from the get-go. And then you update via images that you can drop on in whole pieces instead of pa individual packages. Then you don't even have to have SSH on the host. You can manage through like an optional container or kind of an out-of-bound method we'll talk about later. Um, so you can eliminate those problematic pieces and replace them with things that are a little easier, um, a little easier to manage. So all this, it, you know, kind of depends on um, if you consider your workloads heterogeneous or homogeneous. Uh, you know, if you think about something, you have web server, database, AIM friends, and video transcoding. These are all separate workloads that you would usually run on an individual uh, instance. Um, they, back in the battle days before containerization, you would have a general purpose Linux distribution and you would manipulate that and mutate the uh, general purpose Linux to serve those different roles and grab the right configurations and dependencies and packages um, to, to set it up. Um, but now that we think about containers, you really don't need a whole lot. You don't need those configuration dependencies and packages to actually just host a container. Um, so for example, like you just need your, the kernel and the init system, and then you have the runtime, container runtime like container D and your orchestrator agent like Kublet. And that's all you really need to run a container on the host. So you can kind of simplify it down a lot. But what, if you're running those workloads, 
you're actually deferring a lot of those dependencies, configurations, and packages to the base image uh, of whatever that might be. And you can then keep the requirements, uh, the host requirements much smaller. Um, so that really enables you to think about things in a different way, right? Uh, so from the container operating system, from the host container OS, um, consider it to be running a homogeneous workload, but your users are seeing a heterogeneous output. Um, and because we're doing that homogeneous, we can really simplify things down a lot. Um, if you'll allow me to kind of anthropomorphize things a little bit, um, when we have uh, that simplification allows us to really take a more critical look at the security profile of everything that's going on here. Um, so imagine we're having a container a, a conversation with our operating systems and I say, what can you do, right? The general purpose OS would say, you know, I can do anything. And then the container OS would say, I can only host containers. And of course you'd have this general purpose OS, but I can do that too with my package manager. Um, so um, what's required in the general purpose OS is you can have, of course, you have to have your management tools, your SSH, your package manager, writable file system, everything's there that you would normally need in a general purpose OS to support its mission of being general purpose. But you would also need things like Kubelet and ContainerD. Um, and then on the container optimized side, you only need ContainerD and Kubelet to really accomplish your mission. And what ends up happening is these other bits and pieces that you have to carry around with you are potential security issues, things waiting to break, things waiting to have vulnerabilities and so on and so forth, but you don't really need them to host the container. So you can minimize that security profile and you can lock down anything that any privileges or uh, like SE Linux policies that you would have that would be needing to kind of weaken your security profile to support a package manager or a writable file system. So um, yeah. You, you can see where you're, you're you're gaining something by simplifying. And what really is important about that simplification is, you know, the workloads don't really care that much about it. Um, of course, this is something that applies to any operating system, but just evaluating if your container cares about what your host is doing, it doesn't really. Of course, it has the base images in the workload, and so your workload really sees that base image. It doesn't see anything about the host OS. It's abstracted away, right? Um, and then optimizations that you do at the host level are invisible. Um, the container runtime provides that namespace and then anything attaches to, uh, and your workload attaches to the base image, right? So what you're doing is providing an abstraction layer um, and you have to explicitly give any resources that you need uh, from the host OS through container runtime to the base image. Um, the consequence of this is you can do all sorts of wild stuff and there's no real dependency that you have to have except for maybe the kernel uh, and being able to run those agents needed on the host. And so your workload just kind of works. So you can do all sorts of crazy stuff and, and these container optimized Linux distributions have taken very different paths. So um, that's what we really rely on in this, this process in making these optimizations. Um, when I have to start thinking about, and this is kind of an important slide, when you start thinking about mutation, that's what we're generally going to talk about the, on this, this slide. Um, you have this general purpose distro. We've talked about this before. Um, it comes with a bunch of different dependencies. They're represented by these little blocks on the screen. Um, you only need a couple of them, but you need more than what's provided, right? So these other ones that are in the kind of light blue, they're not necessary for what you're doing, but they're still there. So when you boot it up, you have to actually start making changes to it. And you add some things in with a package, changer, a package manager, which you have, means you have mutated your operating system. Then you start using it and you need to upgrade something and those yellow boxes represent updates. And so when you start compare the left and the right here, you notice that they're two different things. They have changed substantially from what they weren't once were. And some people will manage this by replacing entire instances uh, with new instances with fresh installs. And that works fine. But for a lot of circumstances, you have to upgrade individually um, packages in these situations. You know, um, there is some advantages of keeping an instance around in a cloud situation 
you know, there's availability of hardware, so on and so forth. Um, so some people don't want to do that. Uh, regardless of what's happened, why you would or would not want to do this, you're in a situation where you have the possibility or you have the reality of a mutated system. And the larger picture here is across your entire fleet, they're all going to start looking different. And this is what we call drift, right? Um, the individual nodes start drifting apart over time. And with that, you have multiple versions running concurrently of individual uh, dependencies. You have these kind of very uh, varied uh, different instances running around and your patching situation requires you to know more intimately what individual instances are running. It becomes a headache very quickly. And what a Bottle Rocket and, and the other um, container optimized OSs tend to do um, that they look at it from a different perspective. So the images are ready to go when they boot. Um, they can immediately join a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so there is not that mutating step that is required um, and you're just ready to go. The, the consequence there is too, they're all the same. So if you're running a particular version of these container optimized OSs, um, certainly Bottle Rocket and, and Talos, um, they're going to be the same no matter where it's you do, right? Like you can inspect the system and say it's running a version with, uh, you know, Bottle Rocket just runs a version and right, and you have certain settings and Talos might have some add-ons that they have added to it. Um, but they're all the same, right? They're inspectable and saying this is one instance is always going to be like the next instance, which is really great. And then when the upgrade comes along, you just replace the entire thing instead of upgrading it package by package. Um, and when I say image here, there is some, there is a little bit of a overloaded term here. I'm not talking about an AMI or, or a machine image. I'm talking more about the actual operating system. So uh, you can have um, in Bottle Rocket's context um, and the other ones are similar in many ways, um, the ability to kind of drop in a new version of the operating system um, and then on reboot, it switches to it. So that's how that works. Now, um, these are our immutable. Um, you cannot change these pieces. And we're going to get to that in the next slide. Um, this is where people start getting a little lost when I start talking about immutability. I'm talking about why mutation is maybe not great uh, and making things mutable. It's not, not a fantastic idea. But how do you get anything done in an immutable an immutable way. Um, of course, there are parts of the file system that are mutable and are writable. Um, things like downloading container images, writing logs, these all require um, being able to write the system. And you know, you protect it in other ways, like Bottle Rocket uses SD Linux policies, other there's other mechanisms as well. Um, so this is your mutable section. Then you start looking at the immutable section. So Bottle Rocket has uh, a root file system. This is the same with Flatcar as well. Um, so once it's running, this root file system is ready to go, right? And it's running. Now you have a partition A, you're probably guessing we have a partition B involved. Uh, partition B is where the next version will be downloaded, right? It is the inactive partition and it downloads the entire image of the operating system if you wanna do an in-place upgrade. So it gets that and it you have a new version and you can there's many different ways to set up this uh, this uh, operation, but effectively what's happening is uh, you have one and then when you reboot, it swaps to the other one. So I'll do this again. So you've running in partition A. In the background, partition B has downloaded the entire operating system. When you reboot, um, it switches partitions and now partition B is running. And when you need to download another version, that will download to partition A and then you can swap a game. Um, this way you, and this is a trip bootloader trick, right? This happens before the operating system even gets going. Um, so, and you can set this up. There's a Kubernetes operator that will do this or an ECS is kind of, uh, circumstance. There's another way of doing it. Talos and Flatcar all have mechanisms to control that and allow you to, to have some, some say in it. So it's not just like a surprise upgrade. Um, and what's really cool about that is you can potentially, you know, 
start upgrading your fleet, have it all downloaded and do a huge wave and it all upgrades at the, at the same time, right? Some really neat stuff that you the patterns that you can you can really implement doing this. Um, so that's how that works. And the root file system is immutable here, but the rest of the file system is immutable. Um, and so you're retaining your container images when you reboot and you're, you know, you basically drain a node and then bring it back up and you can rehydrate it. Um, the other questions that people tend to ask me about this is I want to explore the system or I want to administer it in some way and I need access to that host file system and you've taken away my SSH, you've taken away my access to the shell. How do I get anything done here? Um, and they think that it's something that is, you know, literally appliance and someone else is entirely in control. And that's not the case. Uh, the way this works, if you want to get access to that file or resource on the host file system, you can certainly do that. Uh, and this is actually a pattern that will work other places as well. There's nothing special about this, but it is employed pretty, um, pretty uh, um, extensively in container optimized OS because we take away the SSH. Uh, for security reasons. So you want to go in and start uh, interactive shell. How do you do that if there's no SSH? Well, there's important wording there. There's no SSH on the host. Um, so what you do is you have a container that is running your open SSL with SSH server and all that business. Um, and you can log into that. Um, once you're there, you have an explicitly mounted file system that you, or a path in the file system that you get to from the host file system mapped into the container file system. And then you can do that there. So a common pattern, you don't need an interactive shell here, but this is something people talk about a lot is how do I do like a, a logging agent? Um, and you use the same pattern, right? So you would have, let's say you want to get if you wanted to like interactively look at like kubelet log, you can do so by doing this exact pattern. You would just make sure you have that particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, journal entry or uh, that uh, log path, I guess, uh, able to look at journal CTL. You could actually do it from this. Bottle Rocket has a specific uh, concept called host containers that is not anywhere else. I don't necessarily need to go into it. It doesn't make a lot of difference here. That's why it says host container up there. But if you're just doing like an autonomous agent, like let's say you have Fluent Bit and you want to connect it to like Elasticsearch or OpenSearch or, you know, uh, I don't know what you're using to aggregate your logs. Um, but what you would do is basically run uh, effectively a daemon set that has access to the log that you're looking at on the host file system. And then it's, you know, uh, pushing that out, uh, shipping that out to, the, to your search uh, engine that you're using to look at your logs. Um, so it's totally able to do that without ever having to touch the host. Uh, what's cool about this and what's great about this, especially from an interactive perspective, is that you can like kill that container whenever you want to because your control plane is controlling the access to the container. So you can be running all day long with nothing running that has anything open to the outside world in any way. Um, so it really increases that. So you basically elevate the ability to have an SSH server for a moment while you need it and then take it back down. Um, the other interesting pattern that you can do here, Bottle Rocket uses something slightly different. By default, Bottle Rocket doesn't use any SSH. Bottle Rocket uses SSM's um, session manager, which is if you, I would encourage you to look at like the architecture of session manager. It's an AWS specific thing, but it's fascinating because it has no outbound ports. Everything is uh, or no inbound ports. It only has outbound ports to kind of a centralized location. So you have nothing running. Uh, I think it's an interesting thing to look at, but you can load an a SSH server on Bottle Rocket and many people do just for ease of use. Um, anyway, so that's how you get access to these things. Now I've mentioned before, there's an API. Um, how an API works is an interesting thing too. If you wanna do something normal, like change the max container log size, Typically, what you'd have to do is log into your server, your general purpose Linux host OS, and then you'd make a change to some sort of uh, configuration file. That's probably a kubelet configuration, so you're making a change to a YAML file probably. Um, but you have to know where that file is and how to restart the process at first fully, so on and so forth. Um, 
or if you want to change the DNS, you have to go in and log in and then change a different type of file. God forbid it's like wicked and you're having to use XML or some other uh, terrible thing to do. Um, this requires skill and, and it's this kind of like things being inconsistent. Um, the way most of these um, Talos and Bottle Rocket specifically do this, they, they use an API. Uh, they cut out this whole idea of having to do anything in a, in a session and then it uses an API that has a consistent interface. Bottle Rocket uses a version of the uh, of a HTTP REST type interface. Uh, Talos uses gRPC, uh, but you have this interface and then it makes the change to the configuration file on the host for you. Um, and that is a consistent API. So if you want to change the DNS, it's the same kind of endpoints um, and it makes that change for you. And that makes it really like repeatable, right? Like you're not, changing a file and changing line 43 here and line 28 there, um, you're making a repeatable call that has like potentially like item potency and all that great stuff that we, we really love. So um, I've hyped up th these things for 30 minutes. Let's talk a little bit about when it's not a great idea to use this. Uh, it's not a panacea. Don't try to use this in every circumstance. You're going to cry. Um, if you have deep host level integrations, for example, if you're running some other software on your host, think twice. Um, generally, in the pattern, you don't want to do that, and a lot of people don't, um, or you have some sort of specialized kernel. Some people have really specific kernels or ways that they're doing these things. These are things that are inherently not in the scope of these container optimized operating systems. Um, Along the same vein, if you have specialized or custom hardware you're running. So an example of that might be you're running some sort of FPGA in your cloud or you're running AI inference hardware that's specialized. I will tell you these have a kind of a sealed system with limited drivers. They're probably not going to support those devices. And once you start tearing it apart to add that, you've really broken down many of the benefits of it, right? So that's something to warn yourself of. This is probably the biggest thing that people run into is that they have policies. And what I mean by policies is like company ways of doing things that prevent them from using these operating systems because they require prescriptive use of certain security agents. Uh, this is a little bit, this is an organizational problem, not a technology problem, frankly. Um, but for example, there are security agents out there that prevent you from writing to your root file system, you know, logging that or preventing that entirely. Um, and they bury themselves very deeply into the system. That doesn't make a lot of con uh, make a lot of sense in context of having an immutable root file system. Um, why would you need that? You don't. Uh, but changing that policy or getting an exception becomes uh, a Scythian effort that is never going to be able to get done. Um, so you have to think about those kind of interpersonal organizational challenges that would be kind of something very different. Uh, many people have taken on the challenge because they feel that these container optimized OSs provide enough benefit so they don't have to, to do anything with it. Um, and then I'm not sure about this audience, but uh, home labbers or tinkerers, um, these are not the operating systems for you. In fact, it is the opposite for that. I have a rack downstairs with some, some machines in them. I don't run Ball Rocket on those. I don't run one of these on those. That's not what it's for. Most of the time you're tinkering or using your home lab for other reasons. Um, you know, you want to understand something more deeply. You want to try some experimental things out um, inherently these are that kind of sealed idea where you have a limited set of features that constrain the size, that constrain the potential holes. Uh, and in home lab, you want to like go crazy and go nuts on it. So uh, I wouldn't suggest it for those. Although I did, we did have a few person that uh, had uh, an entire room in his apartment full of machines that were running Bottle Rocket just for fun. Um, so um, I don't, not for me, not for the general person, purpose person. If you're involved with the project, maybe that's what you want to do. So I've put a lot of information out at you. I think we've now come to Q&A. Um, I saw some things come in. Uh, what do we got? Cool. Yeah, so some things came across the chatter. Um, I'll start at the top. The first question is about Disa Stigs. I'll pause real quick. Kyle, are you familiar with the idea? 
of like I, I have not come across this terminology. I am so sorry. Oh, not a problem, man. Like geographically, we have a lot of people that are interested. A stig is like a framework uh, that the U.S. government uses for securing systems, right? So really, it's basically like where could we go to find information on like properly securing bottle rocket or you know container based OSs in general. Good question. Um, we do have a, you know, they do, we usually fly past compliance pretty easily, right? Uh, I, I'm not familiar with the US government's uh, requirements. And I'm in Canada. Um, but uh, I know that we do have a couple of things out of the box and we do have a, a significant portion of folks that are in uh, federal government that do use bottle rocket um but i i don't know how they get past this specific um specific regulation i i, I that has not come across my radar totally fair um and for for the recording and for anybody else who's interested in the question who may deal with this in their daytime existence um just speaking personally in my experience the um Everything that Kyle has, has described as a container optimized OS really sounds like a like the term appliance, like capital A appliance. Um, that'll get you a lot of mileage in your discussion with your security people. Um, that that is its own entire discussion, but I think the, that's a good place for the rabbit hole to begin. Um, okay. I'll find out. Uh, I, I have access to people who work on these things, and I'll I'll try to find out for you folks. So sure. I, I don't know the loop on that, but I'll figure it out. And I'm sure somebody has run across it before. Just hasn't okay. me. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the next one that came up was that um, I'll, I'll sort of paraphrase what I'm seeing. So the immutable concept sounds interesting, um, but this kind of sounds familiar to like, you know, what what a Unix, a, a Nix based OS is anyway, because they're always coming out with immutable systems. So like, I think the question kind of gets at like help me understand a little bit better how like I can already create an immutable system like with Packer and a base Ubuntu like you get where I'm going I'm just going to stop I think you get the question. Uh yeah I mean I do I'm not like I haven't been hugely involved with with Nix before it's always been on my periphery um I it is not and I think there is slightly different th differences here um when I talk about the immutability on this it goes to quite a deep level. We use DM Verity. I don't know if you're familiar with DM Verity or not, but it's actually what protects like Android. Um, and you can't even modify a at the block level. It will just reboot the system, right? So the immutability is more about the volumes involved with it than the build. I mean, our build process is immutable for sure, but uh, most people aren't building their own versions of it. They're picking one off the shelf and then applying settings to it instead of, adding layers which is kind of my understanding of 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 nix i'm i'm kind of vague on that a little bit but um they are two different concepts with very similar terminology that's i think the best answer i can give cool thanks for that uh, i also just learned about 30 seconds ago um uh, specifically that there is a nix operating system i'm so accustomed to seeing star nix to abbreviate that for like anything that uses the Linux kernel, right? No, you got it right, Kyle. I was like, I was catching up. I had never heard of the Nix OS before. And, um, and on the, the Unix thing, um, one thing that's interesting to know, Bottle Rocket and none of these are POSIX compliant and nor can they really follow the Unix philosophy. So it goes, I'll answer that question too, but yeah. All right, going on the list, there was a couple of the good ones. Um, this one's a good one. Okay, so you had talked about um, like communicating with the OS through an API to have it change things. Um, wouldn't that also lead to drift of some form? Uh, no, because you can you can in evaluate that, right? You can go and get your your settings back. Effectively, um, all the settings boil down to Tomal, which is kind of like. JSON, I don't know, it, not a lot of people use Tomal as many as YAML or whatever, um, but you can get that out of it, right? And you can, the, most people will go in and they'll start playing with the API client in one of our containers and start modifying those things. You dump that out and anything that matches that between one server and another server running the same version, they will behave identically. There is no difference between them. 
Um, and in fact, one of the patterns people do is, is just kind of like create their ideal version interactively, pull that out, and then you pump it into user data into the system, uh, into your, your AMI um, and, and AWS say, there's other ways of doing that. Uh, user data is kind of specific, but um, but you can pump that in, and that's the setting you'll use. And and I'll be I'll be honest with you, um, you know, you'll be finding a very similar situation in Talos. I'm a little vague on how you might do that. I think you use Ignite in uh, Flat Car to do some of the configuration, but you can kind of create that from there. Um, but yeah, you're interacting with the API instead of doing it. But it's repeatable and item potent too. That's the nice thing, right? Like you can just apply that change 38 times and it's gonna do the same thing. That makes sense. Yeah, so it's, you're interacting with like the, the, the cluster, so to speak, and you're getting the same, the same result on all the nodes. And it's, yeah, because it's different than VI plus an editor. Or a plus yeah, exactly. A uh, it's not, you would interact with it individually across each node or you can do it a cluster by cluster. Like if you're right. starting a, like, um, for example, an EKS, um, which I have familiarity with, you can pump that in directly and it will create duplicate nodes across the whole thing um, all at one, one fell swoop. But if Got you it. want to manipulate one node for whatever reason, you want to provide a taint to it or or whatever you can, uh, I'm not sure it's a good idea, but you can. Fair. Okay, uh, next question. Bottle Rocket in a home lab, does Bottle Rocket work outside of AWS? Yes, 100%, yep. Um, it, you can download metal variants right now and they'll run on a select amount of hardware. Um, again, we don't package in all of the, we're not going to give you a USB driver to a device that was made in 1993 or 2003 or whatever, 2003, USB was around in 2003. Um, so we have kind of this known hardware list. Um, there is a uh, person that is a company that is running it on IOT devices. These are all things that can be completely divorced from, from AWS. Um, so, you know, give it a try. Um, certainly Talos and Black Car are designed to run in a variety of contexts as well. Um, there is not currently a, um, like, GCP or Azure variant of Bottle Rocket. Uh, but what we're doing right now, uh, we have the Autotree build system that we're building for later. You can look it up on our, our GitHub repo. Um, it's called two liter bottles, two liters, you might get it. Um, but that'll allow you to do more composable builds on it. Um, uh, and then you can layer on different things. So if somebody wanted to like build really specific versions right now, we kind of have a select version that you choose and pick off the shelf. But if you want to apply more deep changes, you'll be able to make those builds. I don't think most users will do that, but it'll be available right now. You have to kind of like fork bottle rocket and it's a mess. No, no one wants to fork that. And it, by the way, it takes eight hours to build. So it is not a lightweight opportunity to, to go in and, and just build this from, from source. That's actually, uh, that kind of segs into a question that, uh, that I had where we've gone through the list of questions in the chat. Um, but like specifically about Bottle Rocket, you talked about going uh, slimming down versus building up. Um, and that it's, if I read you correctly, with Bottle Rocket, it's a build up process yeah. did did you start with a particular base distro or did you literally just like start with the linux kernel and just started putting things together yeah we share the kernel with amazon linux but uh that's it it is and it's built all in rust uh, so you have the everything is uh compiled binaries built in rust it's all on github you can take a look at it the bottle rocket dash os slash bottle rocket um there is no other lineage there. It is uh, completely clean sheet. Wow, that sounds like a lot of work. Uh, yeah, it is, and we have some real talented people. I'm not nearly as talented as some of our, our engineers that are, have done this. They have just volumes of knowledge, and I, I try to pump that out to the people uh, that, that need to have it. But um, yeah, it was, it was several years worth of work. We came out in 2020, uh, and we've progressed through that. Um, through those, those years and it's really grown even since then. We have something like 500 settings that you can manipulate through the API. And Talos has smaller, Flatcar has a bunch too. Um, they have a kind of different process for doing that. Uh, I'm not 100% sure how, how expansive Google um, sure. is, but yeah. 
Yeah, that's, I mean, 500 settings sounds a little bit daunting at first, but when you think about your classic, like, let me take an Ubuntu distro and then SSH and do it and then do things, I mean, you're talking like 500 million options. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you look at, like, for example, uh, you know, we're, we're transitioning from Wicked, which I mentioned, which is like a, for networking to network D, um, you know, just the, the vast number of things just for your network setting is, is so immense that, you know, we have narrowed it down to the most important and essential ones. And sometimes we're doing, we're setting multiple things at one time when you pass in something you want to do, it is then uh, translating that into multiple settings. Yeah, that's, I, I like that simplicity. Um, there was, a, a, so another thing that caught my attention was talking about how you had the visual with the two partitions and how you basically like shotgun updated OS uh, versions of the OS and you just reboot the instance. Yeah, that one. Um, yeah. You just reboot the instance and use the uh, the bootloader trick to, to update to the new one. This is a really clever thing to me because in, what I'm accustomed to seeing is you just have a brand new cut of the updated OS and you're just going to drain and crush the old instance and you're going to create a brand new instance with the new version. Uh, yeah. I feel like what I just described is kind of old and busted because I, I can I can already see the benefits of of what you're talking about here with I don't have to repopulate uh, all the workloads onto the new instance they're already still there. What are what are some other benefits that that I'm not thinking of? Yeah, so there's there's other benefits too. Um, you know, one of the things that you end up doing when you're thinking about this is if you were to like try to do this on any other operating system, um, you're going to have to deal with like differences in maybe let's take your network configuration you, know, you change that or whatever um because you know bottle rocket and talus work very similar in this way they use settings right um they have an api that does this you can actually do things at the operating system to manage those settings and then manage rollback as well so for example what can happen is let's say for whatever reason it doesn't boot the next time when you change it over, you can then basically roll back those settings in a way that's safe, right? Um, so, and and there are there are some things that you can automatically roll back in Bottle Rocket, but that that's I usually don't say that because uh, <laughs> really you manually need to roll it back. Um, so that's a huge advantage when you're talking about like configuration files. You've created yourself an unholy mess to try to unwind and rewind and you're never going to get it right frankly yep i've lived that life let's see that's that was all the questions that were that came out of the out of the chat um i'm looking at the notes that I, that were made while you were talking i think we got through all of those um i'll i'll just yeah i'll open it to the room for a quick sort of last opportunity for any other comments or questions for Kyle. Uh, while we wait for that, Kyle, I think, yeah, yeah, you've got it on the slide. I was about to ask where people can find you, where they can connect with you, but that's on the slide right now. So that's perfect. Um, any, any other last thoughts or parting comments before we, uh, we call it for the recording, Kyle? Yeah, uh, we have biweekly community meetings. Uh, if you go to bottlerocket.dev, we have links to those. Um, so if you want to get involved with it, you can do that. And um, Bottle Rocket itself isn't hiring, but uh, we do have some open source uh, program manager roles. If you're interested in working in open source at AWS, let me know. Uh, I'm glad to uh, connect you. But they are location specific to the West Coast, but maybe you want to try out Seattle or Portland. I don't know. Uh, let me know. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Kyle, thank you so much, man. Thanks for.